Greetings, families. So good to see you here. Thank you for joining us for our session on leases, landlords, and life off campus. How we support your students' next big move. Now, families, we're joined with a number of great presenters from campus tonight, including one of our very own proud AU Eagle families uh, members. This is parent Scott Sprouse, uh, parent of Henry, who's graduating with us in the class of 2023. Before we get started, I've got a couple housekeeping items. And also I should mention families, as we talk about this topic, it's, it's particularly relevant to me too. Some of you know that I'm a, a double eagle myself. Uh, I moved off campus as a sophomore, much to my parents' chagrin or surprise perhaps. Um, but I also have a college junior living out of state who has recently moved off campus. And I'm very excited to share with you families that my high school senior just got admitted to AU. And so I might have, an, yeah, my own eagle as well, right alongside of you. Yeah, thanks all. So a couple housekeeping items tonight. You're welcome to pose your questions to us at any time using the chat function um, on the ribbon up here. We've got some folks behind the scenes to try to help answer the questions as we go. I'd like to introduce Thomas. You can give a wave. Thomas Epps is our brand new Associate Director for Family Engagement here joining the team. Many of you know that that's the position that I originally held. I could not be more excited to have um, another full-time person on my team to help support all of you. And so we're going to do our best behind the scenes. But folks, there's about 500 of you who registered to join us this evening, and we are not going to be able to answer everybody's questions. So at the, la at the end of tonight's session, we will have a slide up with the contact information. Um, and I would remind you, of course, you may always send us an email to auparent.american.edu and we'll work to get you the answer that you need. Um, of course, this session will be recorded and we will share that out to you along with the links to tonight's slide deck. So don't worry about keeping all the notes. We will share them with you directly. Um, I'm going to review for just a minute, like our agenda, and then I'll turn it over to our presenters. But we're going to walk through some of the off campus housing and roommate search resources that we already offer to students. We'll spend some time with our colleagues from the Dean of Students Office talking about how we support students when they do decide to go live off campus and what does it mean to be a responsible AU student in, student in the neighborhood. We've also invited colleagues from financial aid to help answer your questions about how those financial aid awards and packages can be applied to students when they're living off campus. We know that was a big question for many of you. And Scott Sprouse is here to share some very practical parent to parent advice. We'll open it up for live questions and answers and we'll share out our contacts and details about the upcoming off campus housing resource fair that we invite students and family members to join us for. Now, families, our dear colleagues in housing um, are, are dealing with a number of items this evening, and they'll be joining us shortly. But I do want to share with you a brief overview about some of the resources that we have available for students. This is throughout the year, but of course, we're ramping up our offerings right now. Many of your students have been going through the reapplication housing process. And when Martin joins us later this evening, he'll be able to answer more of your questions about uh, whether uh, we're seeing movement on sort of wait lists or openings of new rooms, and he'll talk through that. But let me just share with you a little bit about the resources that we have available for your students. We have a whole website dedicated to supporting students with their off-campus housing search. And there you'll find details, including the link to our virtual housing fair that's coming up. It's Thursday on March 31st. And families, you're welcome to join us. During this event, we invite property managers who are local or common renters to AU students to come join us. They can offer things like walkthrough tours of the properties and talk through the terms of leases and options and pricing. So I strongly encourage you to join us or at the very least have your students sign up. We also have opportunities for students to post for roommates, either that they're looking for a roommate to, to pursue a housing option with, or perhaps they're already an established roommate grouping who's got an opening. And now they need to find another student to fill out their housing situation, whether that's a group house or an apartment. 
And so these matching opportunities exist. Students fill out a profile. It's pretty easy and intuitive. And students have had a lot of great success with it. There's also, I've, we've got a, a screen grab here of the off-campus housing services. There's a quick video that you'll find on this website at offcampus.american.edu. And that'll kind of walk folks through, whether it's your student or yourself, about the kind of services we offer. And lastly, and probably of most importance to you, is this off-campus housing uh, opportunities and, and guide. Our team in the housing office reviews posts from various property owners across the city who would like to attract and work with AU students as renters. And there's a process that we go through to vet those property listings. So some of them have been such signature partners with us that it's a, it's kind of a non-brainer, a no-brainer. Like we post their postings. Others are newer to us, and we do make sure that they meet the standards for the District of Columbia uh, for being licensed as a reputable and um, and quality housing option that has met all the criteria for occupancy for the District of Columbia. I will invite Martin to share more details with you when he joins us later. This slide just offers a screen grab, a quick snapshot of what your student would find when they go to search for a property option. And just like, as you see, it's, it's in partnership with apartments.com. So this is gonna look like a lot of other search uh, apps where you can look by location, by pricing type, by amenities, and get to see what the property owners are sharing about their own units. Through our off-campus housing resources, your student can also sign up for a roommate profile and search for those roommates that are, that are looking for others, just like your own student. What I wanna stress here though, families, is this is a resource for your students. And what's really important for me to stress here is that th there's a reason for this. The properties that we that we curate on this list and these roommate opportunities really are restricted for AU students, which is a benefit. These are sometimes properties that have not been posted to the general public. They're not on the general market. So your student has some inside advantage. And certainly when it comes to facilitating these, these roommate matches, um, this is a great way for your student to find other AU students that they can know and trust uh, as part of their own AU community when they're trying to navigate their way through this. Now families, there's another piece of all of this off-campus resource support that we've got. And I've invited my colleagues from the Dean of Students Office to join us to talk with you a little bit, uh, give you a little insider perspective on kind of the expectations that we have for our students when they do move off campus. What does it mean for them to be responsible and good neighbors in the community? Justin, I'm gonna turn it over to you to introduce yourself and I'll advance to the next slide so we can kind of share with, with our families the kinds of ways that the Dean of Students Office supports our students when they make this transition. Sure, thanks Karen and thanks for having me tonight. It's nice to speak to all of you. I'm Justin Bernstein, Associate Dean of Students um, and Director of Student Case Management. So I run the group of individuals who um, operate our care system. Um, and a big part of my role is also fielding neighbor complaints, um, whether it's related to student issues or um, other parts of the university. So I'm happy to answer questions that come up about that. But um, the main takeaway for all of this is that, um, like Karen mentioned, we expect all of our students, whether they live on campus or off campus, we actually expect all of our community members to adhere to AU's good neighbor policy. Um, a lot of what is covered in the good neighbor policy is things that you have set the foundation for them um, while they were growing up with you at home. Um, but there are some things that are a little bit more specific to AU and to DC in general. So you definitely wanna make sure that they are reading that policy um, and adhering to it. It's not very long. Um, and it's available in multiple venues. Um, most importantly is through the Student Code of Conduct, um, which can be found in many places on the student's website, um, on their portal. Um, but we also offer an off-campus living orientation program that is required for all students who are living, currently who are living in the general zip codes around the AU area. We might be expanding it out a little bit more because students are going kind of further and further 
out from campus. Um, a lot of things about, you know, how to be safe and secure in DC, you know, keeping your wits about you. It is a city, um, living in a neighborhood, some tips and tricks on how to maybe proactively create good relationships with your neighbors so that um, when there is an issue that arises, you've already built that rapport with the neighbor so that they are coming to you rather than maybe escalating things um, further up. Um, some aspects of maintenance and upkeep that maybe they, you know, didn't pick up growing up, but um, things like, you know, if you have to get rid of a mattress, do you just put it out by your dumpster or do you call DC 311 and have them set up a time to come and pick it up? And hint, hint, the answer is the second part. Um, and then university and local resources that are helpful for um, being a good neighbor. Um, yes, and Karen, you can go to the next slide for me. Um, and at the end of the orientation, um, it outlines what our expectations are. And really the main takeaway from my presentation is all students, whether they live on campus or off campus are expected to adhere to the good neighbor policy um, and expected to adhere to the student code of conduct. And even living off campus, students are still held to the student code of conduct. So if they have a gathering and two students get into an altercation at that gathering at their off-campus property, they, the students are held accountable through our student code of conduct and conduct process. So um, just everything that they would be doing on campus, we expect them to be doing it off campus. And we do provide support through orientation um, and through our student conflict and conflict resolution services um, that can help. Um, and hopefully we won't get any neighbor complaints from them. Um, but when we do get neighbor complaints, they're usually related to trash, to uh, parties, to some kind of alcohol gathering that happens off campus. Um, and generally, our office's policy is to reach out to the students because there's two sides to every story um, and try to find out what's really going on with the residents. And a lot of times these incidents can be resolved through, you know, talking to the students about how Maybe the next time you have a gathering, reach out to your neighbors beforehand and say, here's my cell phone number. So if you have an issue, text me or call me rather than escalating it to, you know, the university or to calling the police, um, just to kind of be proactive. Bake cookies for them so that they really like you. And then when they're, you know, upset that you have, you know, a lot of trash in the trash can, um, they remember your cookies and not all those bags of trash that you left behind. Um, and then this last slide, I think, is just our campus and community standards pledge, which, um, again, Karen's going to send the slides out so you can read it later, but it's really just saying that students are going to adhere to the student code of conduct and to our good neighbor policy, and um, we hold all of our students to the same standard. That's it for me. Thank you so much, Justin. I think that really is a good overview. I mean, I think it is important for families to recognize that students are still held to standards, we expect them to behave just as the, the kinds of students that we admitted to be part of our community. Um, you know, like I've, I've, I bought my house in DC at a fairly young age. I think I was not yet out of grad school actually. And uh, I remember distinctly that my group house that I had just built, we would frequently make sure that our, our neighbors knew every time we were gonna host a kind of an event, like we'd knock on doors. They looked at this a little crazy, but I think it definitely earned us some goodwill and we invited them to come join us. Um, but just to kind of make sure that we were all on the same page about being respectful that there were households of all different configurations that we were literally sharing walls with. Um, and so it definitely did us some good to be respectful from, from the very beginning. So thank you, Justin, for that. Um, we're gonna move on. I've asked Shirley McDonald to join us to, to help answer some questions that had come in about uh, whether and how financial aid can be applied to students as they move off campus. Charlene, I turn it over to you. Hi, welcome everybody. Thank you for spending some time with us tonight. I'm going to very quickly go over some of the main points um, regarding financial aid and students uh, moving off campus. The very first thing that I want to impart is that your student and you have a financial aid counselor, your very own. Um, the way that you find out who your financial aid counselor is um, those both with aid currently and without 
So you don't necessarily need to be an aid applicant at this point. If you have questions about how do I apply for aid, um, you know, even if I haven't received financial aid uh, in the past, please reach out um, to um, your assigned financial aid counselor. The way that you find your counselor is actually by going to our main website, which is american.edu backslash financial aid, all one word. And then on the left navigation menu, selecting uh, the second option that says contact us. Um, from there, all you need to do is put in the last, I'm sorry, the first letter of your last name. Um, from there, it'll take you to the directory and give the direct contact information of your assigned counselor. Um, so you don't need to navigate this process on your own. There's actually someone there to help you. The next piece of information I wanna share is that yes, whether you live on campus in university assigned housing, or if you move off campus, the financial aid that you received that used to apply to the housing cost on campus will actually be given to you in the form of a refund each semester to cover your housing costs off campus. Now, the very third thing and last thing that I'm going to note is that um, in most cases, the amount that you paid on campus will be equivalent or it might actually be slightly less if you move off campus. Um, so the funding that you receive should be sufficient to cover the housing costs. However, if you sign a lease with slightly more, please work with your assigned financial aid counselor so that they can reevaluate your standard cost of attendance, which takes into account, you know, what you would have paid had you stayed on campus. And if um, eligible, if the lease amount that your student is paying is greater than that standard, then we can increase the cost of attendance. But again, this is within reason um, to account for the additional costs that your student will incur. This is done on a case by case basis, and you do need to work with your financial aid counselor to increase that cost of attendance. Now, why is it important to increase the cost of attendance? We cannot provide aid in excess of that cost of attendance. So if you need to receive additional funding either through you know, the parent loans that are available or um, other sources, then you really do need to address the actual costs that your student will incur for housing um, so that we can amend the cost of attendance and increase uh, the amount of aid that you're eligible to receive. Okay, I know covered a lot in a very short period of time, but hopefully um, you come away with one, you have a person and you don't have to do this alone. Two, the aid that you would have received had you stayed on campus would be given to you in two equal installments, like as if the student was still in university assigned housing. And then third, if, you know, by some chance, the lease is greater and it is your student's portion of the lease. It's not the total lease. We will calculate if they have a roommate and they split it evenly. <laughs> it is your student's portion of the lease over a nine month period. Super important because unless the student is enrolled in summer, fall and spring is the only period in which we will calculate for that lease. So if they sign a 12 month lease, we're going to be looking what cost will they incur during the nine months of attendance. I forgot to mention that, but those are the takeaways. I know I've given a lot of information. Please work with your financial aid counselor should you have any questions. Thank you so much, Charlene. I mean, I was going to say, listening to you, it seemed like the takeaway was work with your financial aid counselor. I mean, really, that seems to be the main point. Also, families, of course, as I've mentioned before, we will make a recording of this available. If you feel like you need to replay it and double check your understanding, you'll have that. And then, of course, your financial aid advisor. But Shirlene's going to hang out with us for just a bit, and we'll see what other questions come through. Thank you so much, Shirlene. All right, folks. So now we get to hear from our guest parent. This is Scott Sprouse, parent of Henry, who's about to graduate. Um, and he's got some experience to share. He's he, with his students. He's got two, not only one is with us at AU, but um, who've gone through this, this shift to move off campus. And when Scott and I were talking about this, when he pitched this as an idea, it really struck me that 
you know, this is a big transition as we parent our young adults into the next phase as they grow along this journey, right? This is a very different kind of preparation and coaching period than when we sent our students to live in the residence halls. And so I really wanted to give Scott the chance to kind of help answer some of the questions that you've got. He's talked to some other AU families through social media to gather their questions and concerns. And Scott, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself. Great, hi, I'm Scott. I just wanna first say that, um, Karen, thank you for asking for ideas for these, uh, these webinars. And I want to say this came directly from conversations that parents were having on a Facebook group, Facebook group that I administer. Uh, it's named uh, American Chill, and it's for parents and any adult who loves, likes, tolerates, sends money to a student at American University. And we share information, we share opinion, we share fun. We're basically just sharing life and trying to fill in those places that um, give you the answers to the questions that don't have an official answer. And so this was a discussion that was taking place regularly on American Chill. So I thank those parents who were asking those questions because when Karen asked me, what should we talk about on a webinar? What have we missed? Immediately I said, off-campus housing. So I'm gonna tell you, I remember the summer of 2019 going to orientation, being on campus, in hearing those words that housing is only guaranteed through your students' sophomore year. And then I remember someone asking, well, what are average rents in Washington, DC? And I heard those numbers. I did not have a lot of concerns when my son left for college, but I will say that I had that dread, what I thought two years before and I really needed to have it. It was something that weighed on me. I kind of freaked out, I'll admit. Look, I would have especially freaked out if I had known that Henry would come to us towards the end of his freshman year and talk us into him moving off campus for his sophomore year. And then I would have even more freaked out if I had known after the deadline had passed for on-campus housing, COVID hit. So we went through the entire process of him finding an apartment to live for his sophomore year remotely from our home in Nashville, Tennessee. The first time he stepped foot in his apartment off campus was the first time he saw it. Lease had already been signed. Lease was signed before we even found out that campus was gonna be closed for his sophomore year, but he still went. And I will tell you, Looking back, if I could go back to that day in 2019, I would tell myself, do not freak out. And this is how you're saying, yeah, you can say that, Scott, but this is how I can prove it. My son right now is studying abroad. He gave up his apartment to study abroad. He is in Chisinau, Moldova right now, which a few months ago, people didn't say, where's Moldova? Now they know, because if Ukraine on a map looks like Pac-Man, Moldova is the power little dot that Pac-Man's getting ready to eat. Henry doesn't know where he's going to be living in the fall, but he's already started the process from Moldova. And he's starting to talk with roommates. He's starting to look about properties. They're doing shopping. And so I am not freaked out in the bit about that. And I kind of amaze myself with that. So just a couple of things I just wanted to say is the process is there because just like when your student goes into the housing office or the financial aid office or anywhere on American University campus, the people in those offices are used to working with college students. The same thing, whether or not it's a huge apartment complex like the Berkshire, or it's someone who's renting a basement apartment in their house a couple of blocks off campus, they're equally used to working with college students. They understand the questions that you're gonna have about how do you handle semesters and how do you handle the lengths of, the, of the, the leases and things like that? Because if you have an apartment near a college campus, your students are primary, I mean, your customers, your tenants are primarily going to be um, college students. And so they're going to be familiar with that language. Um, the most important thing to take from that, other than just being chill, though, is to recognize don't let them drive the process. They may know the process, they may have the experience but they're not your advocate. 
and they're definitely not your student's advocate. So you still have some responsibility there to make sure that you understand what's going through and you read all the documents and you know what the rules and what DC requires and that your students know that as well. So thank you again, Karen. If there's any questions in particular um, someone would like to ask or anything you have, just feel free to let me know. Thanks, Scott. I mean, I think you just touched on one that we've seen a good bit about it, which is like, you know, our property managers uh, offering nine month leases or 12 month leases. And I mean, I know it's been my experience in Washington DC and, and I'm also a landlord, like, uh, you, you know, those, as you said, those property managers who are particularly reaching out to AU to share their listing, understand that they're posting their listing with students. And so offering options that are gonna be conducive to that academic year schedule, I think is in their best interest, right? Um, Scott, I wonder if you can talk a little bit though about how you and Henry thought through like where safe options would be, or you know, is it convenience, is it public transportation? Like how do we assess whether a, a property feels safe and appropriate for your sure. students? Well, one of the things, and it's important in every aspect is you have to think about where do you wanna live, not the apartment or where do you live? Where do you spend your time? Are you on campus all the time? Are you um, off campus with friends? Are you downtown? And that's one of the things to think about is where do you live life? How do you, um, what are your transportation options that you use when you're living there? Are you really someone who's on the Metro? Henry had a car. Um, he didn't have it on campus his freshman year, but when he moved off campus uh, and his apartment provided parking, he took his car. So that happened a little, it happened a lot. But one of the things that we did was um, we were very intentional. Um, when he was, when he was on campus, when he was visiting friends off campus, when he got to know people, find out where they live, what their experiences were like. Um, there's no better information you can get about a place to live than from someone who lives there. And, and they can tell you what their experience has been. Um, when we were on, uh, when we would come to DC, when we came, um, when we came on family weekend, um, we asked where are some places that students live, and we would have him point out some places. And so when he started talking about places to live off campus, we already had an idea. My wife and I already had an idea. Well, where is that geographically? What does that look like? What are the routes of transportation um, for us? Um, part of it was a safety issue, but it was a convenience issue. And that really, how quickly, how easily could he get back and forth to campus? And that was proven to be a good thing to consider um, because just before sc this school year started, um, Henry tore his ACL and actually was in, it had surgery the, the first week of classes this fall. So we had limited mobility. So that really worked out well for him. How easily could he get back and forth to campus? But I think the most important question to ask is, um, how do you live life? Where do you live life? Where do you spend your time? And how do you, uh, what transportation do you use and what transportation options are available to you? And do you feel like those are convenient? Do you feel like those are safe? Awesome, Scott. There's so many more questions in here that I'm gonna lob your way, but some folks have been asking about UPass and parking and families, your student gets the UPass uh, when they're full-time with us, whether they live on campus or off campus. So that's great. And to, for those of you who don't know what I mean by UPass, this is uh, a card that provides them with unlimited travel on DC's Metro bus and Metro rail. So that's great. And when we're thinking about where your student might wanna live off campus, that really does open up a whole range of opportunities for them. Um, so I've also had families asking about which neighborhoods that are mostly AU students. I mean, I think, to some degree, you might expect that the neighborhoods closest to AU, so we're that 2016 zip code, but not limited to 2016, that that's where you'll find a lot of students. But, but really, as Scott's hinting, it really depends on what your student is interested in um, and you know where they're finding their home base, whether it's an off-campus job or an internship or just a really cool group of people doing fun things. What I think is so great about students living in DC is there's so many students from all these other universities. And so it's quite natural for students to fall into a housing situation with students from Georgetown or GW or Howard or folks who are visiting. Um, Henry's, you know, Henry's roommate, his sophomore year was a recent graduate from Georgetown. See, and, exactly. And, and he's, he's likely gonna be 
moving. He very likely could be moving back in with that person when he comes back to DC um, yep. next year. So a number of folks have also been asking about what happens when my student wants to move off campus for, or, or find alternate, or they're going abroad, I should say, right? So on one hand, if, if your student is living with us on campus, we have policies in place and that's pretty straightforward, right? It makes it pretty easy. You're not in a lease, right? You're just in a term by term housing agreement. So when your student is going abroad, you're just not signing up for that housing and we adjust the billing accordingly. But Scott, Henry's gone abroad. <laughs> so yeah, he's here right now. Yeah, yeah. So what tips do you have for families whose students are planning to move off campus and then trying to figure out what they do when they're going to be gone for several months at a time? Well, the first thing to do is to plan how you leave. And as you would with any relationship, um, be very upfront with the schedule and with the intention. Let your roommate know um, whether you're going abroad or not. Let your roommate know um, what your plans are for the next semester in a time that gives them options. You, you don't want to tell somebody that um, you decided you're not going to stay in the apartment next semester when it's already past the deadline for on-campus housing to register for on-campus housing. Likewise, you want to uh, you want your landlord to be able to have options as well. And what Henry did is he went to his landlord and um, he, he was gonna need to have a new roommate anyway, um, but he went to his landlord and told him that uh, he'd like to continue. He had finished the first year of the, of the, of the um, lease and said that he was gonna be going abroad in the spring and he'd like to stay during the fall. And he was, you know, what would the options be? Would he do a short-term lease? How much would his rent go up because of that? And because of when and how he communicated that to his landlord, his landlord let Henry and his new roommate, who was also a, an AU student who needed housing for just the fall semester because he was going abroad in the spring, let them stay on um, through the end of the year, the end of the calendar year, um, on a month to month lease with no increase whatsoever to their rent. And it really came down to being responsible and, and being upfront and having those discussions. What Henry's doing right now and coming back, what the process he started is, is he is reaching out to friends um, in school. He's reaching out to, with friends in, uh, he's really involved with uh, campus outreach and campus outreach has students throughout DC. And so he's, he's reaching out to those students and already looking at a couple of places because He's not the only one who's coming back from being abroad. Um, I think one of the things that can cause us to get a little, a little nervous about this situation is, is that we live fairly stable. You know, we're, we're grownups. We've lived in the same place, many of us, for decades. And the idea of even moving is, 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 is tough. But these are kids who live on a semester by semester basis. And so it's pretty fluid for them. And these are conversations that are taking place. There's social media sites and you've seen the websites and these are things they're talking about. So ask your student to start having those conversations, make sure they're having those conversations um, so that as these groups are starting to pair off or quad off or whatever they do, how many they do it, that they realize that, 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 that there's a place for them and that they're interested in such of a place. I think really a lot of it's just being intentional and communicating with your friends and your peers and uh, the folks who either you're renting from or you could be renting from. Thanks so much. Um, I know we've seen some other questions around, um, you know, what are, what's the availability? What's it really looking like for on-campus housing units? And I think Martin is still hoping to join us soon, but um, I've talked with the, my colleagues in housing every day this week to kind of check in to see what the process is looking like. So one, to remind folks that our, our policy has long been that we provide housing for all of our first year students and all of our sophomores, our rising sophomores who meet our deadlines. And that is the extent to which we've been able to have the capacity to support those students. Now, juniors and seniors, we always have a mix of juniors and seniors on campus, but our availability of units to meet that need for juniors and seniors is kind of limited. Um, and frankly, we find that a lot of juniors and seniors are happier to move off campus. I will say this families, that the, the available units change by day. So if your student is still hoping 
to get an off-campus housing spot, they shouldn't give up that hope. They should just go check in every day. We've posted on our uh, housing website the deadlines that signal when uh, we've asked students to notify us of their plans to cancel. So lots of students went through the process during let me sign up for the housing while I look for an off-campus place and then they find an off-campus place and we invite them to let us know this. So throughout the summer, we're gonna to continue to see a lot of movement. So I, we encourage your student to go back and check the portal and look for those rooms to become available. So there's that. Um, I, I see that another one of our families was asking, you know, what if my student is really involved? Is there a way for them to get on campus? Well, there's not really a different tier because they're a club leader or they're active. Like we invite them to participate in the process, just like any of the other upper class students. The caveat here is that there are some student positions that come with housing. Notably, that would be the RA selection process. So if your student is interested in working for housing as a, as a member of the staff, then they should explore those options as well. Scott, I'm going to come back to you. We talk a little bit from a parent perspective, how you've worked to support Henry and his roommates to, to have those conversations up front about things like, what do you do when a roommate leaves unexpectedly, right? Because right. you still got to cover that bill. Let me ask too, like Scott, considerations you'd recommend for parents about whether they should co-sign a lease or, okay. or not. And, you know, things like managing utilities, like what does this really look like? Well, I want to first say that one of the things that use these discussions as a test, because a question that comes up with how do I know if my student's going to be ready to move off campus? And not every student is ready to move off campus or wants to move off campus. My older son graduated um, from college in, in 2020, he lived on his campus all four years. It was the best thing for him. Now, the good thing about it is, is since graduation, he went and negotiated his own lease and has his own place, and he did all of those things. Um, it's the right thing for him. But the real first test is, if you're having to push your student, if your student wants to live off campus, they're going to bring it up to you. But if you're having to push the process, if you're having to be the one to really make sure that all the questions are being asked and all the documents are being ta are taking place. And if there's an application or a fee, if you're the one who's having to push those that push that process, your student's not ready to go off campus um, because then you're gonna be dealing with issues and making sure the rent's paid and that they're following the rules and all of those things. This really has to be a self-motivated student to be off campus. Um, because nobody off campus is in the business of educating your child. Everyone in American University, and no matter what department they're in, their end goal is to support the education of your child. And so they're going to have that support system. Go off campus, they're just a tenant. They're just someone, they may have a good relationship, but at the end of the day, they're just someone doing, doing the bill. But one of the things, again, we're talking about is have, don't assume anything. Talk about everything. Um, talk about who's responsible for the cable bill. Talk about who's going to who's bringing in the microwave and who's bringing in the television. If you're not sure, put together a list. It doesn't hurt to have an inventory of who's is who's when you come in, just so there's no confusion who the PlayStation Two belongs to. Um, go through those things. If um, and something that's really important to me is look and see what the exposure is of any of the documents in the lease. Now, where Henry was living, he was living in the Berkshires. And so in the Berks, the student is, does not need a co-signer. So I, we really, I reviewed documents. I helped him when we were going through it, but he signed it and he took, he took the lead of that. Um, they had a system set up where Henry paid his half of the lease through a system, an online system, and his roommate paid half, had paid his half through an online system. Um, now, that didn't mean if Henry's roommate didn't pay that Henry wasn't ultimately responsible because one roommate can get both roommates kicked out, not just for non-payment, but for behavior. Um, but it was one of those that since it really, I wasn't a co-signer, I didn't really get involved in that process. Um, since I wasn't exposed, I didn't really keep in hand, uh, you know, keep hands on it or eyes over it at all. Now, I will tell you that if I'm ever co-signing on a document and I have some responsibility, my experience and my 
expectations are going to be a little bit different. But I think the most important thing to do is, is to recognize the maturity level of your student to be able to follow rules, to take the additional responsibility to handle things like rent and utility payments, to live with people who may not be students. And so they don't have the same expectation, the same lifestyle. Um, they may be a little wilder, or different lifestyle, or they may be a little less wild than what a student is. I mean, this really is moving into the, into the grown-up world. So discussing those expectations so there are no surprises. Um, I will tell you I have learned this with my older son moving out of dorms for four years and for Henry moving out of um, the Burks just this last December. Um, the last person to move out loses because you're the one who's like, oh, what's this? Oh, so-and-so left this for me, thought maybe I would want it. Well, what are you going to do with it? I don't know. You're just going to end up having to throw it away. So just part of the thing of keeping the list of whose is what is what you get in and what you get out and just to make sure everything works out cleanly. It's all about talking. It's all about communication. And then sometimes it does have to be in writing. So go ahead, Shirley, I'm sorry. As a segue, I'm going to make a shameless plug um, because one of the things I'm passionate about is making sure that our students understand the basics of managing their finances. Um, we actually do have a number of um, presentations that we give throughout the year uh, that talk about, do you know how to make a budget? Do you understand how much of your funding you should be putting towards housing? Um, will you have enough food to eat? Do you, right? And so um, this past fall, I did uh, the basics of budgeting a workshop, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, um, that we'll be able to offer that again uh, sometime later this spring. Um, but these are the conversations if your student isn't having now that you need to be having with your student so that they understand, look, the rent's going to be due typically before the fifth day of the month. If you are responsible for utilities, is it in the actual lease that they're gonna cover a portion? You know, you have to pay for trash. So there are a whole lot of um, small print um, that you um, need to be aware of in these rental agreements and lease agreements um, that um, I try to partner with my colleagues in housing to go over with our students so that, they're una that they are not caught unaware and left legally responsible um, and many times, if there is a roommate, I strongly suggest that there is a legal document that you sign that indicates um, who's responsible for what should there be unpaid rents. And that's, that's my, my advice. <laughs> No, that's great. I mean, this is, this is, a, there's a lot of responsibilities to come with this. I find though that I think a lot of students really relish the chance to kind of prove to us just how adult they can be. They just need us to coach and walk them through this. As I mentioned in my intro, my oldest is actually a junior out of state and has landed an off-campus lease. And frankly, I had, I had really nothing to do with it. I wasn't asked to co-sign it. I wasn't asked to check in on it. Um, they knew what their financial capacity was and, you know, what I could offer as a fallback and then made those decisions. And sometimes that leads to some hard questions like, hey, so my part time job isn't quite giving me the hours I thought. Can we talk about, you know, what you might be able to do to help me? So, I mean, I think these are really useful conversations, but I, I kind of err on the side of letting our students struggle and figure some stuff out because then they have ownership, um, as I also mentioned in my intro. I bought a house uh, in DC at a very young age. And I, I firmly do believe that it's because I had done so much legwork as an undergrad to find my own housing that I felt like I really knew what the landscape was, what rents were, and whether it was worth trying to buy and take on a mortgage versus renting. So um, I'm grateful for it. Uh, if my parents had done it for me, I would have gone in clueless. So thank you, Shirley. Um, I believe Martin has joined us. Martin is with the housing office and he is the point person for our off-campus housing resources. So 
Martin, I would like to invite you to join us. There have been a couple questions, particularly around if you can share based on your work with some of our off-campus housing partners, those property managers who reach out to you time and again, what kind of advice or what would you predict for families who are trying to figure out the timeline for this, right? Like we're talking about this conversation now. And in most cases, these students aren't really looking to have their housing in place until mid to late August. So how does this affect when we might see notifications about vacancies, when properties might be ready to sign leases? Like what advice would you have for those who are searching? Yeah, and uh, hi everybody, great to be here. Um, Karen, can you give me a thumbs up just to confirm you can hear me okay? Wonderful, okay, thank you. Uh, hi everybody, good evening. Um, I am uh, kind of remotely working uh, at the moment. So uh, if anything is unclear there and uh, we're not able to pick up what I say at any point, um, by all means, the, the biggest part I'll, I'll state here is that uh, myself and my team um, are willing to, you know, meet with students and families and connect individually as well. So by all means, follow up with us. Um, so in terms of the question about timing with off-campus, um, I think it probably has been stated, and I think it's good to remind here, we will be having an off-campus housing fair on Thursday. Um, so we, you know, with the idea there is that we encourage, you know, starting to think about these questions now um, and exploring. So I will say from my experience in the area and what I've heard from many students and property managers um, is that most leases have a 30 to 60 day notice on um, someone intending to leave. So with that in mind, you know, if you're looking for a lease to start in August, um, you know, you would expect one to two months in advance of that, that the unit you might be interested in would come online. Um, however, you know, I think as you narrow down what you're looking for and where, um, that will really guide, um, you know, you know, at least reaching out to, you know, a management company and say, hey, you know, this is what I'm looking for. When will you, you know, have it available? Um, and then they can kind of guide you based on what their projections are for their given building. But um, I will say it's fairly common for that to happen over the summer. And then, you know, we always host this housing fair in uh, either March or April, because that's a good time to, you know, at least be starting to have those conversations and you know, planning the timing for when do I have to apply by? What do I need to have, you know, on hand to be able to complete an application um, in a timely manner and to, you know, to meet whatever standards they're looking for. So that prep in advance is really good. So you're just ready to go um, as soon as a unit of interest becomes available. Thanks so much, Martin. Um, Scott, there have been some folks asking some very specific questions. Uh, I think you've had a chance to check a few. Did any stand out to you as, as ones you'd like to respond to, yeah, including there's just, somebody, there's somebody uh, also asking about your honest opinion of the Berkshire apartments. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to first go to the detail. I'm going to handle the Berkshire apartments. The Berkshire Apartments is a very good place to live if you are a college student. Um, it was fine. It was, it's, it's, it's a fine place to live if you are a college student. Um, Henry never had any issues um, with livability and it was fine. Um, I'm not, not going to say it's going to be a place that I would live, but I had absolutely no problem with with a college student living there um it was close to campus it was affordable um they worked with him on his lease they um so it was it was good um i think he would still be there if he didn't have to give up the apartment to go overseas um one thing to talk about was to talk about how do you handle with going overseas something it's not just going overseas how do you handle the summer and what we did with our lease and the length of the lease was um Henry signed the lease at the end of May, but negotiated to where he didn't pay rent until August. So it was worth for him going ahead and signing the lease in May. If he did not sign a lease in May, if he didn't have that option to him, he probably would have waited and signed one in July um, to have an apartment available for him in August. Um, because if you're doing a 12 month lease, you have to remember, are you gonna be paying for the summer at the beginning of your year? Or are you gonna be paying for the summer at the end of the year? And where were you going to be? Because in a 12 month lease, you're going to do it one way or the other. And they made it very easy for us to decide that first summer because we didn't have to pay rent until August. Um, the second summer we came across, we kept the apartment, even though um, Henry was at home that summer. And that was just a calculation of cost. We realized how much would it cost for us to move him out of the apartment and to transport his things 
back to Hendersonville or back to Nashville. And that included not just the cost of the gas and the moving truck and all of that, it was our time expense as well. How much would it cost us to get to DC? How much time off our schedule would we do? And we realized that it was easier for him to keep the apartment for three months, cheaper for him to keep the apartment for three months than it was to move out. Um, now that he's gone uh, left for an entire semester, and then that will also include a semester, include the summer, we gave up the apartment and he put things in storage um, storage can be pretty expensive in DC proper, um, but we found a place not too far away, about 10 miles away in Virginia, and we're paying a, uh, about a little under $70 a month for storage for his, for his things. And so that's how we kind of balanced out keeping the apartment, not keeping the apartment. It's worth us saving the money and him starting from scratch his senior year with looking for a place to live off campus. Um, some of the practical things you have to consider when you're looking about is not just the rent, but are you paying for parking? What utilities are included? At the Berkshires, I can tell you that electricity is included, water is included, trash and parking is included. The only two things that a student there or a tenant there would be expected to pay for is cable. And I don't know anybody uh, in their 20s who has cable anymore and internet. And he went with an internet package and in, this is gonna be my little tech tip. Um, don't rent the modem. You can go buy one that will fit for them. You can go buy one for 40 or 50 bucks off Amazon or, Bay, or Best Buy or anywhere like that. And they'll have it forever. And you won't be paying five or $10 a month to rent that thing. Um, but that's what he had to work out with. And you have to look at those things as the cost. Also with food. I will tell you, if you do this right, and it's very hard to do this wrong, if your student does this right, it will cost less to live off campus. Now, what does that mean? Are they prepared to cook for themselves? Are they, how are they gonna handle transportation? Now, if there's somebody who's gonna be Ubering to class every day, you're not gonna save any money. If it's somebody who's gonna be uh, eating out every meal and not taking advantage of now having a fully functioning kitchen, you're not going to save any money. But you have the right number of roommates, the right unit, the right transportation plan, the right um, budgeting for utilities. And my son learned to cook when he was in when he was in the apartment. And he found out that he was eating better and he was eating less expensively um, just by going to the grocery store once or twice a week. And it worked out really well for him and helped with, with habits on that. Um, anything else we're trying to think, I hit some of the, the points on that, but those are each are points. My experience is, is not your experience. My son's experience may not be your son's experience, but those are all factors that have to be decided. Um, it's not just the cost of the rent and it's not just, um, yeah, and it's not just the time you're on campus, it's the rest of the year as well. How are you gonna handle, um, how are you gonna handle either keeping the apartment or keeping your things you see when you don't have the apartment? And so I Scott, yeah. we, we promised to talk about how to find a, a good deal on a used sofa. Okay, if you ever decide that you wanna go in the music business and you come to Nashville, that's where I am, and you wanna buy a guitar, never buy a new guitar because there's always somebody selling a used guitar in Nashville. Same thing with a college campus or college community and a sofa. Don't, there's, we have, I had a son four years in, in college and now Henry in his third year, we have never bought a new sofa. And I think only once has actually money ever been involved in the transaction for a sofa that one of them used. Someone's always getting ready to move out of an apartment and they have furniture um, that they're ready to give. It was kind of a joke when we were moving Henry out. We were like, do we want to put this in storage and throw it away? And my wife would say, let's throw that away. And some kid who was helping us move hollers out, hey, I'll help. I'll, let me take that. Can I have it? So they would do that. But here's the best way to do it. Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist. Um, there's an Ikea right outside DC in Virginia um thrifting 
you know, the, the, it's, it's pretty easy because don't put a lot into the furniture. Put something that they like, something that's going to last a couple of years because the person they end up living with five years, 10 years from now, they're not going to want to see it. They're going to want it to break down. Um, they don't care that that was their favorite end table when they were in their college apartment. It's going to be gone. But there is a lot, just like the students are talking right now about where they're living and who's living and trying to work with roommates, there is always going to be a way to do that. I would make sure that they have good appliances. I would make sure they have um, good sheets. Um, I would make sure that um, they have what they need to make sure they have an internet access and all the things they need to do for students, make sure they got good parking and their cars taken care of. But other than that, there's this whole underground economy and online economy that you can, in a, in a few weeks, a few days, less than a week, somebody in DC with a pickup truck um, could get everything that they needed for an apartment off Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist or a friend. Thanks so much, Scott. We've got just a few moments here before we have to wrap up for the evening. So I want to remind folks to please use the contact information that we've got on the slide now, especially the AU Parent and American. You know we'll do our best to help get you an answer to your question. Martin, I'm gonna ask if you can share in the chat and maybe discuss just briefly for those families who are here because their student did not get their preferred housing assignment in the selection process, if you can just share out what the next steps look like if students are still looking for that on-campus housing. And I know you and I talked about like those follow-up steps, like what's the rolling process look like? Yeah, uh, great question. And uh, Scott, I would uh, love to get some more of your advice on our off-campus webpage. So we should definitely connect in the future. Um, yeah, so where we are now is the initial housing selection for students concluded last week. Um, and uh, there, you know, we had, um, you know, more interest in housing than we had spaces at that time. That is completely normal and what we see every single year. Um, so we're prepared for that. And, um, you know, we, we look at it in the sense that, you know, much like we were talking about when you need to move into an apartment off campus is we've got time before we get to August. And obviously, you know, on your end, we want to balance that with, you know, concern and confidence in where you'll be staying for the fall as soon as possible. So we have a pretty detailed webpage, which I'll kind of say, just because I know we're getting to the end here. Um, it's called our rolling reapplication webpage. It's linked right off the homepage for our website. Um, and so what that page does is it's going to share everything a student who's um, either looking to start uh, living on campus in that they don't have an assignment or if someone has an assignment and they want to change it, um, all of that information is there. Most specifically is we do have cancellation fees and the way it works at AU is those increase um, in amount uh, across the summer. So the closer we get to August, the higher the fee. So what we've listed on that webpage is the date and time that we will send reminders about fee increases. Um, and what that tends to do is result in people who are waiting to cancel to cancel right then those spaces become available and students um, who are awaiting a space can then select them at that same moment so we give all the dates the times to kind of mark your calendar um, and what i will say is historically those students who have wanted to live with us um, and who are willing to work with us kind of as we go into the summer uh, we have historically been able to house all of those students and you know and to, to karen's point um, it may not always be your top you know, number one choice of space on campus. Um, but, you know, again, if your primary goal is I want to be on campus and I want to, you know, stay with the university because of, you know, some of the perks, which do include, you know, I saw a couple of questions about study abroad. We will, you know, let someone move in for the fall and move out for the spring at no cost and vice versa. Um, so, you know, we have that as an advantage of living on campus. Uh, we'll work with people. And again, once we get people on campus, we still get vacancies. We can do room changes during the year. So again, we have a lot we can work with you over time. And, you know, the big thing is just take a look at that web page um, and then feel free to reach out to myself and my staff. Thank you so much, Martin. I want to open this up and just see if there's any of my other panelists who have any parting advice or suggestions for our families before we close out for the evening. Thank you, Karen. I just wanted to talk a little bit to the questions that I saw um, in the chat, two pieces. Remember, you do not have to navigate this alone. You do have a financial aid counselor, please reach out to them. But specifically, yes, for our continuing students, financial aid award packages will be given throughout the month of June. And we know that you're beginning this process a lot earlier. Assume that your aid package will remain exactly the same. So whatever portion of assistance was given to you to aid in covering the on-campus part 
of uh, housing, that's what you will have available to cover the off-campus housing, right? So it is a dollar to dollar. If something has changed, your financial circumstances have changed, it is imperative that you reach out to your counselor now so that we can recalculate and give you an idea of what you may be eligible to receive for the upcoming 22-23 academic year. Thanks so much. Justin, anything from Dean of Students that you'd leave parents with? Uh, tell your students to check their email and do the orientations that we require for them in a timely fashion. That's great. Um, and I know Martin has shared out resources. Folks, I think, you know, like I've been a landlord myself here for a couple decades now. And I'll tell you that this really is a very dynamic rental market here in Washington, D.C. There are countless folks just like me who are good and honest and 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 wonderful landlords uh, who have basement units, who have rooms in our houses, folks who are in State Department and they're deployed, so they just need somebody to house sit. There's a huge network of students who find themselves needing a spare roommate. I mean, it really, it does happen. Our students do not start the academic year without housing. It, it happens. So some of this is just encouraging your student to talk to their friends, to explore and to try some things out. Um, lots of stuff changes. There's a lot of great resources here. And again, those of us here on the slide and sharing out with you this evening are here and more than happy to help you and your students navigate the process. So I wanna thank yeah. all of you and all of my panelists for taking the time to come out for this evening. Again, we will share with you the recording of tonight's session and our slides just as soon as they become available. And of course, you are always welcome to reach out to us at auparent.american.edu. Thank you and good night.